Thank you all for coming at such an ungodly hour on a Sunday. My, my. Uh, sadly, this talk is not going to be up to my usual standards. Two reasons. One, I am severely sleep deprived after a week of IETF. The second reason is that I gave a talk about Quick last year um, in London. It was supposed to be a fun talk uh, where I had superheroes for the protocols. So Superman was TCP and Batman was TLS. It was all fun and games until uh, the video made it to YouTube and I got this comment. <clears throat> and you know, that just, that, that cut me deep, right? As it says before, I'm, I'm very sensitive to what random people think about me. And if, if there's one person not approving of my approach, then I start to reconsider my life's choices. And so um, I was looking to curl up and, and talk to Jim and he said, you know, the, the idea here is to go very, very deep technically. I was like, yes, finally an opportunity for me to redeem myself in the eyes of, of Richard. So Richard, this is for you. Um, <laughs> Not at all. <laughs> <laughs> this is, by the way, being recorded, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'm gonna link him yeah, this is the video of the rich. talk. Yeah. Yes. Like, oh, I, the point I was trying to make is I got just one of these comments, but I see, like, on Twitter, um, a lot of women on Twitter, technical women, get these kind of comments on, almost exclusively or a lot on their work, which I think is terrible. I just got a few of these and I already feel, feel like shit if I read this, so. I can only imagine what they must think, so... Try to be kind online, or else you will get this kind of talk. So what I'm going to do is, is go try to go very, very deep technically. I've prepared like four of the topics uh, from, from Quick. Uh, please, if I go too fast or I'm not making any sense, interrupt me, ask questions. Um, after the four topics, you can ask questions. I'll try to answer, <laughs> if I know the answer. Otherwise, I can talk some more uh, about other things or probably will be out of time by then. So the reason I want to do this is because Quick is relatively complex. Like there are six main documents and the page count is almost higher than the book The Hobbit, and which we all know they made that into three movies. So I'm looking forward to episode one, The Phantom Head of Line Blocking. Um, but the main point is that these pages only describe what you need to do to make Quick work, not why that is necessary. The why is hidden in like enormous amounts of issues and meeting minutes and, and vague presentations that have been done over the years and in the minds of the, the mad scientists in the Quick Working Group. So what I'm trying to do here is take a couple of the things that might not be immediately obvious, why they are the way they are, and try to explain them. Uh, that they make sense. So the first thing about Quick is the connection setup, um, which is uh, one RTT. So you just need one RTT, you have a full encrypted setup. They do this because they use TLS 1.3. If you know TLS 1.3, this, this should be very... Uh, uh, you, sh you, should, you should have seen this kind of thing before. There are only a couple of things that are different, like there is no end of early data message uh, that they send because we don't use TLS for that, we do that in Quick, so that's the zero RTT uh, stuff. We also, th the way I understand it is that when you use TLS, you normally just pass your data onto TLS, and TLS encrypts it and puts it on the socket, right? The way this works is not, you put your data into TLS, it gives you back the encrypted data, and Quick itself is going to put this on the wire. So it's a, a kind of a couple of small differences that have made a big impact in the way we have implemented it which I'll talk about soon. So what you see here also is that there are different type of encryption levels. Uh, so if the client hello, server hello, those are not encrypted. Then you have uh, the handshake stuff, that's the curly braces. And then you have the normal one RTT, the, the normal messages that you have. Those are fully encrypted. <coughs> so while we use TLS 1.3, the idea is that they try to be a bit more abstracted. They try to be a bit more decoupled from this. So um, the concept there is that they have a crypto frame. It's very simple. It just treats TLS like an um, opaque byte stream. You don't really care what's in there. You just say, TLS, give me some stuff. Uh, I'll put this on the wire. The other end <coughs> receives it, gives it back to TLS. And the only thing, the main thing TLS has to do is just do a callback with, uh, a callback with encryption keys. Because 
Again, Quick is doing the encryption itself. The only thing it needs from TLS now is the encryption keys. Now this was kind of a problem because this is not the way normal TLS implementations work. So what we do for Quick now, at least some implementations, are using a custom version of OpenSSL that allows this kind of uh, interaction with the TLS stack. Um, this is not in normal SSL yet, in normal open SSL yet, so I think that might also lead to a bit of a friction in early deployments, just like we had with ALPN for HTTP2 at the beginning. <coughs> but so it should be possible in the future to go to a different encrypted connection setup other than TLS 1.3, in theory. Um, and, and this is just to illustrate that it is indeed a opaque byte stream. So this is, these are logs from my own quick implementation, and you see I'm logging here the crypto frames, and I wanted to, to log what is in the crypto frames in terms of TLS. This is difficult, difficult because it is an opaque byte stream. I shouldn't be able to know that. So what I'm doing here very dirtily is just taking the first byte, which is the record type, <laughs> and printing that. And after that I print probably, <laughs> because it could be if you have a long record that has been fragmented over several uh, quick uh, packets, that first byte might be rubbish. That might not have, uh, hold any meaning at all, right? So usually this works, it's nice for debugging, but you do need to keep that into account. That also comes back later if you're doing HTTP3 stuff, like Quick and HTTP3 are kind of decoupled, so Quick doesn't know much about HTTP3 stuff. And it can be fairly difficult to debug um, inside the Quick layer what HTTP3 is giving you because of similar reasons. So like I said before, there are, for the handshake, uh, different encryption levels that you have. So the initial packets, um, that's mainly the first thing that the client sends to the server. You can't fully encrypt that. To do full encryption, you need keys from both sides. So what they do here is um, they don't encrypt it, but they go into hash it in a way that um, the message cannot be changed. So it's integrity protected. They do this with something called authenticated encryption for associated data, which is just the fancy way of saying, you know, an attacker can read everything that's in the packet, but it can be changed. So it's safe on the wire. This is kind of difficult, uh, different from zero RTT, because zero RTT can only be done if you've already talked to the server before. So the first time you can only do one RTT, and the server gives you uh, some keys in a new session ticket, which is the TLS 1.3 way to do it. So a new session ticket has already some encryption keys in it. And so the next time you connect to the server and the server remembers those keys, <laughs> it's in the cache somewhere, then you can actually fully encrypt that initial zero RTT packet. Uh, so it's, they can't read it, they can't change it, but like I discussed on Friday, they can do a replay attack on it. Just replay it again and again and again. That's the only problem that is there. Then you also have the handshake and the one RTT uh, encryption levels, and from then on, it's full go, everything is encrypted. Now, <coughs> this is an extreme amount of complexity, all within the one RTT <laughs> part of Quick. Everything else after that is, is kind of simple in terms of encryption. Um, and it, it gets worse. That's the second thing that's on the slide. It's, it's the PN space, it's, it's packet number space. So what you might expect is that the packet number is just uh, um, just increases monotonically across the connection, right? We start at zero and every packet we send we just do plus one. You might expect that. That there's a problem with this. And I'm going to try to explain it. The full explanation is in the reference there. Um, the initial packets can in some ways be faked by an attacker. Not completely but at least for the packet number that can be spoofed. That's one part. The second part is that Quick says if you receive a duplicate packet number, you need to drop the second one, right? So what the attacker can do, let's say he spoofs packet number six. Quick receives packet number six, processes it, even though it doesn't contain good data, but the actual packet number six that comes behind with the actual real data is then dropped by Quick because it's supposed to drop duplicate packet numbers. And so it would become quite easy to do a denial of service on um, the quick connection setup for a man in the middle. As far as I understand it, that's the main reason they split up the packet number spaces. So you have a separate one for initial, you have a separate one for handshake. 
And then they go like, you know, <laughs> we're not going to be consistent with the encryption levels because 0RT and 1RT are going to share one packet number space. Right? The reason they do that is because that makes loss detection and congestion control easier because you're both reasoning about application layer data in those two encryption levels and the other two are just the TLS stuff. They try to make it easier, but in fact, in, in practice, this has been a huge pain in the ass to implement. Because now, for the congestion uh, or, or the loss detection, you really need to take into account these different uh, packet number spaces. And when they added this, they did not update the pseudocode for the loss controller. And so everybody was just scrambling to, to find out, okay, so this is what it's supposed to do. How the hell am I going to implement this <laughs> in practice? Since then, they've updated it, logically, uh, luckily. But that was like, I spent a good two weeks on that. Putting this into because previously, of course, everything was just one packet number space and, and no encryption levels, uh, or, or at least not split out as this way. Now, so this is the way it's supposed to work according to the spec. There is one browser vendor who does not follow this. No. I'm going to give you one one chance of guessing who, and I'm going to give you a hint. It might make it easier. They also have an operating system. <laughs> what do you think? Oh, come on. It's one in three. <laughs> one in four. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so. so, what do you think? Who, who, who do you hate most? Just call that name. Uh, then I've got some bad news for you. Because it is, of course, Microsoft. So Microsoft, um, they apparently had a lot of code that relied on it being a single packet number space. <laughs> and they really did not want to switch. And they had a long, long amount of tries to try to prevent this from happening. The other guys pushed them away. And they just said, oh, we're going to do it anyway. <laughs> so they still have a, a single uh, contiguous packet number space. And this works because Quick allows gaps in packet numbers. So the packet numbers have to be monotonically increasing, but you can skip some. This can help with, with uh, as I understand, also encryption and security, so that you, the attacker can't try to figure out your packet number sequence if there are gaps, which so is fine. I wasn't aware of it. How long has that ever been going? Uh, since the beginning, but they are not open source, right. obviously. <laughs> yes, uh, but they are uh, active. There, there is a Slack group for all the quick devs where all the implementations are there and they are very active there and on, on the github it's just not open source and they're the only ones currently doing this um, <clears throat> so this only works because you have the, the packet number gaps they are allowed and this leads to some excessive loss detection well not really loss detection it's some excessive acknowledgement like quick does negative acknowledgements and you will get negative acknowledgements for the missing packets <coughs> But Windows knows, uh, WinQuick knows that that is expected, so we can just ignore it, right? So it's, in a way, it's very elegant that it works. In another way, it's, uh, you know, terrible. It's a bit unfortunate that we already are making weird hacks around it. Right? Yes, <laughs> yes, even now. So even now, there are already changes in that. So I'm just saying this, if you ever try to debug Quake and you, you go to a Windows implementation later, you will see different behavior probably than everyone's. Okay, so um, one of the things it did to make these encryption levels a bit easier is to actually give separate packet types to each of them, which is easy. You, you can make rules like if you acknowledge handshake packets, you can only do this in another handshake packet. You can't do this in one RTT packet, that kind of stuff. So that makes the logic a bit more manageable. And, and these uh, packets. So I'm, I'm not going to uh, talk about retry packets. If you want to know more about that, that's at the end. Uh, but the other ones are the ones that we discussed, and they all lose what they you use what they call a long header uh, packet, and then the one RTT stuff uses a short header. So what does a long header look like? This is they kind of change a bit depending on if your initial handshake or zero RTT, but this is the basic idea. So you have some flags on top. They have the version for quick. Then you have two length fields. So the first is destination connection ID length, DSIL, and then source connection ID length. And those are the two next fields. 
that you have. I'll explain what those are uh, afterwards. They have the length of the current packet because during the initial setup you can actually coalesce quick packets in a single UDP datagram. You can't do that with short packets, they're expected to always take up the full UDP datagram. But at the start not because you might have a very small initial packet and a zero RTT packet that you might want to put in a single datagram. So that's why the length field is here. And then of course you have the packet number and the payload can be anything uh, useful at that point. So that's a long header and you can see that's a lot of data, right? You really don't want that coming over the wire every single time. So that's why they say things like version and the connection ID stuff and like I said the length, we can cut all of those out and then we get the, the short header packet. So as soon as the handshake is done we switch to the short header packet it only has the flags and the destination connection ID um, <coughs> on the wire, which cuts back a lot on uh, overhead, which is the, the third topic I'll be talking about as well. So, one thing to note, um, I said that there were four keys. There are actually more than four. <laughs> the first one is that we're also protecting the header. So the flags, if I go back, so the flags on top here, the RRKPP, those are also uh, protected, and then the packet number as well. They are not encrypted. It's more like what you did with the initial packet. It's, it's hashing it so that nobody can change it, and it's more difficult to read. And that's what they call a header protection key. This one does not change. This one, you, you decide this on the first uh, setup, and then it stays the same for all the connections. What can change is this one RTT key. So you decide on the one RTT key after the handshake, you can use that, but at any point during the connection, you can change the actual encryption key and just start using a new one. Again, to prevent things like linkability and then be more secure in that. So you can actually have an, an amount of keys if you have a long-lived connection, which is kind of interesting. Is that well-defined behavior in respect today? In other words, you can change it at any time? No, that is... I imagine there has been literally a discussion of an hour about that right. at the ITF this week where it's not even clear how secure this is and how they should do that. And so the idea is they allow key updates, the exact mechanism is still very much unclear. Um, so that's kind of the, the, hand, uh, the, the connection setup. Anyone has any more questions about that? All right. So I'm going to go to the next topic, which is the connection ID. So I mentioned this before. Um, you have a new field that is not in TCP, it's not in UDP, it's, and it's called the connection ID. And you might have noticed in the long header packet we have two of those. Short header only has one. So I'm going to look at why do we need this, why do we need two, and why, in God's sake, does it take 144 bits? <laughs> because that's a pretty damn long connection ID. So the first reason is, why do we need it? Um, two reasons, connection migration and NAT rebinding. So connection migration is the idea you are, they call it the parking lot problem. You're on Wi-Fi here, the moment you go outside you switch to 4G. In TCP you drop your connection completely, you have to set up a new connection, so you have like a small amount of downtime. Uh, because you switch IP or port. Yeah? To prevent this, um, you can use the connection ID. The connection ID stays the same, for the same connection. So even if your IP address or port changes, the server still knows it's you because of the connection ID. The same goes for the uh, NAT. Uh, does everybody here know what NAT is? Do you need to explain? Okay, so the same for NAT, especially for UDP. Uh, some routers are very aggressive with NAT rebinding for UDP traffic because you don't have the connection logic. So to keep things alive after a NAT port rebind, same mechanism uh, is used. So the connection ID stays the same. Again, just as with the key updates, connections can also update the connection ID. Because you don't want an attacker just being able to view one connection ID on the wire and just track you all the time. So the idea is that you will switch connection ID several times between, in, during a long-lived connection. The thing is that the new connection IDs are actually exchanged or like agreed upon by client and server in the encrypted channel. So the attacker won't know how to link them up, but the server and client obviously will. That's why you can change them over time. So that's why we need a connection ID. But you can do this with just a single connection ID. You just need one field. But we had two. We had a source 
connection ID and a destination connection ID. Why is that? Um, before, if the client connects to the server, obviously, it chooses the connection ID, right? Because it initiates the connection. That's not what you want if you're doing routing or load balancing at your edge. What you really want is to, is to have some logic for stateless uh, load balancing, like you see in the bottom right there. You want to know, like, I have a certain uh, format for my connection ID, and if that format is, this is a very simple example, this is not exactly what's used in practice, it's just to make it simple. If this connection ID ends in two, it goes to server two, right? So you always know the way you have to send your traffic at the end. If you wouldn't do that, you need to always have like a, yet again, a translation table from this connection ID goes to that server. So this is the cut down costs on, on load balancers and, and routing um, in that way. To be able to do that, you can't have the client deciding the connection ID, you have to have the server deciding its own connection ID. This is also something that only changed during development of Quake, that wasn't in at the start. Um, <coughs> So that's why we need two. Why does it need to be so large? It's a final, th uh, oh no, wait, I have an example, fantastic. So this are, these are again logs. And so you see the, the top one is, um, this is both from the server perspective. So you Rx, you receive an initial packet and it has a random destination connection ID. So the, the, ser the client chooses a random destination connection ID uh, for the server. The only thing that really matters is the blue one here, it's a source connection ID. That's actually the one that the client chooses for itself. When the server then replies to that with handshake packets, it will change its own connection ID. So from its perspective, the destination connection ID is the one the client chose for itself. So that's the blue one, that stays the same. But it changes its own connection ID. The, the green arrow here, right? to something it wants for itself. And at that point you have both sides just having decided what they want to do with that if, if, if they need it. Right? So that's an example of how that looks on the wire. It's very stupid that it's from perspective. Like Instead of just saying client connection ID and server connection ID, no, it's source and destination and it depends on the perspective from which you're sending it. But it kind of works. Yes, yeah, so why does it need to be so big? Um, because you want to have enough entropy so you can support a lot of different clients and a lot of different connection IDs. So you need a lot of bytes. The, the minimum byte count for this is four, four bytes. And then you might also need to encrypt your routing information. If you have a lot of uh, origin servers or back servers, or if you already have multiple layers of load balancers that all want to include some of their uh, routing information, you, it gets quite big quite quickly. What they also want to do is not just have this interpretable on the wire. They want to start encrypting uh, their connection IDs, so you also need a couple of extra bits for that, obviously. And then what um, Facebook did in their current implementation, very interesting, they don't just add the, the, the actual server ID, the origin server ID, they also have a process ID. So they, they, they run their own load balancing software and they want to do automatic failovers if they have an, uh, a version upgrade. So they keep on sending stuff to the old one. The, the new one is in parallel. It gets a new connection, uh, the, all the new connections. And so based on the pr process ID, you know if you're going to the old one or the new one. Uh, so they route within the load balancer <laughs> to their own processes, which I thought was fantastic. That's just a Facebook convention. That's just a Facebook convention. That's the idea everybody can do with it what they want. That's what I said here. It's like a generic metadata. You can, you can put anything in there. Um, that's why it's so large, it's being abused. It's kind of like how you abuse IPv6 addresses sometimes, right? You can, you can put anything in there. Uh, same idea. That's why it's nice, it can be so large. You can really put a lot of data in this to do some custom logic. This is, for me, one of the most practical ways to extend quick. Uh, I would have pushed for something more explicit, <laughs> like having like the connection ID separate and then have like, you know, this is the metadata stuff. And <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> they did not go for that. Okay. Let me see. Okay. Um, questions? Yeah. Okay. 
I'm sorry, could you repeat a bit more loud? Loudly? <laughs> I, I didn't understand. No, uh, the, so the way I understand it, you can't validate all those actually that Not as an outside observer, no. Yes. So the, I've, I've, I've referenced here, it's a separate draft. So the top reference there, it's, it's load balancers. And that describes a way, the, the way they are proposing to do it for like a general setup. Um, it's not what is here on the slide. This is just as an example. Um, their way is much more complex and better. <laughs> um, but that's the idea that your, your server and load balancer need to know about each other. That's key. You can't just take a generic load balancer and a generic backend server and have them do this. That's not possible. They need to know and they need to discuss amongst themselves via a separate out-of-band protocol, I think, um, how that should be done. Right? That is important. The thing is, the way they see it, you know, Google and Facebook and all, they, they control their own load balancers and backend servers anyway, so they can do that. Right? I agree. That's not, that's not very clean. But the, the quick working group is driven by CDNs and... But don't you <laughs> think, uh, I mean, going forward, that there will be a few of these systems? So yes, some, yes. Some of the source software will use a common method. Exactly. Usually. I completely think that that will happen. That you will have a few schemes and you just define your, your software. Or and your possibly some of them will be the winners among the open source implementation. Exactly. But that is completely left up to interpretation. This, this draft is just an example. I don't think they expect anybody to follow that to the letter <laughs> in, in practice. But we'll see. Is there any uh, advice in terms of having this field? Or, in, you know, it, it it strikes me that if you have this metadata, um, you probably want to fill it up with nonsense if you're yeah. using that field. It's, it depends. Like, it has to be at least four bytes. Right. So normally, I think most people will just fill it with random so that you have enough entropy to support mm -hmm. four bytes worth of clients. Okay. Most people. And then the other guys are going to go bigger if they need to include metadata, because the bigger it gets, the more overhead you pay for each and every packet that it's in. So I, I think most people will just use the four bytes. That's another thing that I'm, I think I'm going to get to, but maybe I can mention it right now, is that uh, it's also possible to have a zero length connection ID. So it's either four bytes minimum, or it's completely gone, it's not included. You can still do just routing based on the typical five tuple. Right, just the IP import. If you know you're not going to do connection migration or you don't have to deal with NAT, you can just skip the whole connection ID stuff at completely and just do it with <coughs> NAT. Um, but that is intended only for like specific purposes inside your, your data centers or something like that, I guess. But it's that's actually the next point. It's about how flexible everything is in Quick. Yeah, um, should not happen <laughs> if you have a decent <laughs> uh, random number generator, right? Because it's four, it's four bytes. But uh, if it is, then the client, uh, the, the server will just be unable to decrypt the packet because it thinks it's from uh, a previously established connection, right? And it sees a new initial, it doesn't accept that, so it will just send you back a protocol error. And then the client can decide uh, to, to retry a new uh, connection ID on that. But I don't think they're really taking that into account that it's going to be very, very likely that you will have collisions because, of course, those things are per server, right? Sorry, per server. Or per server or per cluster of servers, right? Per service. Let me say it like that. No, if it's more likely to occur due to bugs in implementation. Yes. I uh, <laughs> happen to send the same again, even though I didn't intend. That might be. Other questions. All right, so the next thing is the minimizing of the overhead. So um, the TCP header is always the same size, unless, of course, you include options, but e even the top part is always the same size. You always have four bytes for the sequence number, always four bytes for the acknowledgement number, even if they're very small values. Right, and this is kind of the thing that um, quick goes to extreme lengths to prevent. It wants to save as much on bits as possible 
uh, in a huge variety of different ways, which I'm all going to discuss right now. Uh, so the first example of this was a short header, right? You had a long header, you don't want all this stuff in there, so you throw it all out for the short header. That already does a lot. Then you have almost everything in Quick is a variable length integer encoded value. If you don't know what that is, it's very simple. You just use the first two bits of the value. And those indicate how much bytes the total value is. Right? So you have one, two, four, or eight bytes for your values, which as you can see from the table gives you a lot of range. But so very small things, lower than, uh, than, than 63, can all just fit in one single byte, which is quite uh, flexible. So that's VLE, variable length integer encoding. They also have a lot of optional fields. Like you have here, this is the generic um, uh, data frame. It's called a stream frame in Quick. And you don't always need an offset or you don't always need a length. If you just omit the length, it means it just goes to the end of the Quick package, which is what you probably will do for most cases. If you don't have an offset, it just runs with what you had before, that kind of stuff. Uh, or the offset is automatically zero, something like that. Um, so that's very interesting because you can encode small values very well. It becomes a pain in the ass to implement in HTTP3. Let me try to explain. So this is the HTTP3 data frame. It has a type, it has a length. Both of them are variably length encoded. Right? That means I need to read the first two bits to know how long they are. So if you have a normal quick packet here, the idea is that I had a quick packet. Um, so you have the short header for quick, then you have the normal frame header, and then you have a full HTTP3 data frame. And somehow, due to the way this was done in the implementation, there is one byte left at the end of the quick packet. Just one byte. And we want to be you know, very optimized, so we are going to try to fill that one byte by putting the next HTTP frame in there. Right? That's a problem. <laughs> because you get that, you parse the first one, that's all go, and then you parse the single byte. And let's say that the t that's the type field, and the type field uh, is, takes up two bytes. So you don't have the full two bytes, you only have the first one byte. So you have to decode it to see, ooh, this is two bytes. I only have one byte. I have to put this one byte back into my buffer. <laughs> Wait until the next packet comes in. <laughs> Again, try to decode uh, this initial value, and then continue on this one. Right? So that works, but it's not all that trivial to do in an actual implementation. And this has led to some of the implementers that were against this change to say, you know, we're going to stress test your servers by sending all HTTP3 data one byte at a time. We're just going to have quick packets just containing one byte every time <laughs> to make sure that the, uh, the implementations actually do this kind of logic correctly. Um, is this clear? I, I wasn't sure if this uh, explanation made sense. Right? So it, it's not a problem for the quick uh, frames themselves because they are expected to only be for one single packet. Quick frames cannot span multiple packets, but HTTP3 frames can because, again, quick does not know about HTTP3. It is completely agnostic, so HTTP3 can have frames that span as many packets as you want, I guess. Right. So that's, I'm going to be very fair. I had not kept this into account when I was writing <laughs> my logic, and it broke horribly. <laughs> right. um, so for that blank into coding, almost everything, but not everything, like the Connection IDs in your initial packet are not variable length that you're encoded. No, no, they have separate lengths, right? Because it should be easy to parse and very quick to, to, to do the routing and all of that. But that. They are, however, not 8 byte uh, or 8 bit length. No, no, just 4 bits because 8 would be way too much. So we have like logic, and you say the connection ID has to be at least 4 bytes. So whatever value is in the four bits, you do plus three <laughs> to get the actual amount, right? So you either have zero, which means there's no connection ID, or you have to do plus three to get the actual value. <laughs> which is nice, because we can get up to 18 bytes, but yeah, it's kind of dirty. 
But if you think that's dirty, then, you know. <coughs> I'm really starting to like this, this meme in relation to Quick. Uh, so, I can't really explain this correctly. I don't understand how it works. But the idea is every packet has a packet number. If you would just encode the full packet number, after a while it's going to get larger and larger and larger and larger and larger for your connection, right? You don't want to do that. So what they say is we're going to delta encode this in reference to what we know the client, uh, the, the peer has received, right? So let's say we are at packet number 60 and we know the peer has received number 50. You know, we can get away with a value of 10. That's the simplest explanation. That is totally not how it works. <laughs> because we know it has received 50. But if we just send 10, the peer doesn't know we are delta encoding based on 50. Because by the time it gets the 10, it might have acknowledged other stuff as well. That's where this comes in. And I have implemented this algorithm <laughs> based on the pseudocode, and I have no idea how it works. <laughs> And you can make that a library. I, the, the bad thing is I, I have to change it again because it changed <laughs> in the last round. I, I was hoping to be to be able to get around that this week, uh, you know, to, to finally figure it out and be able to actually explain it to you, but that hasn't happened. In any case, it's like it's a very complex thing that they do not explain in this pack at all. That I really would need to just implement it, give it a few packet numbers, and see what happens in practice just to figure it out myself. But anyways, it, it, the, the end result is that you always have like a relatively small amount of bytes as long as you don't have a large amount of outstanding packets. So the more packets you have outstanding, the larger these ranges of, of uh, packet numbers become, then you get large things. But as long as you don't have huge amounts, like if you don't have a very high speed connection, this is always going to be very, very slow. <coughs> The packet number also used to be variable length integer encoders. They're like, that's too easy. That's too consistent. We're not going to do that anymore. So I'm just, let me get, let me get back up. Here. So you have the packet number field, right? And the length of the packet number is in the two flags on top called PP. That's the packet number line. And the, the encryption or the protection for the header field is done, so you, you encrypted PP and the other flags. You skip the destination connection ID, that's not encrypted. And then you encrypt the packet number as well. So it's like completely disconnected. Um, I think some people thought their implementations were too simple. And they just had to add more complexity. Um, <coughs> I like to say the packet number is also at least one byte long, so whatever value is in there, you have to do plus one to get the actual value, just like you did with the connection ID lengths. Then, acknowledgments. Um, yet another thing that I would have wished I could have explained better, but I only added a slide yesterday night, and it was very late, and I was trying to figure out my code. <laughs> And I couldn't, so I need to go back and write some more comments for that. But uh, the basic idea is that you, in an acknowledgement, so for loss detection, you have an acknowledgement packet separately. You you have a full packet number of, of the the lowest packet, uh, the, the highest packet number you're acknowledging at that point that you know you had is the highest packet number you have. That's a full one. That's a full value that you are fully done. And then everything else is going to be in reference to that. And you're not going to do delta encoding, you're just going to do counts, because packet numbers have to be contiguous, right? That's what I said, uh, monotonically increasing. So what you can basically say is, um, so I have the, the top packet number, and if the first act block then is five, that means that packet and the next five ones, I'm all acknowledging them. Then I have a gap of value three. That means the next three packet numbers that follow that, I have not gotten those. those are potentially lost. So that's the gap. Then I have a new ag block that says 17. That means the next 17 packets, packet numbers, I receive those, right? So you're not really acknowledging individual packet numbers. 
you're acknowledging ranges um, that you can decode by starting from one and then always going down. Just to save one bit, they say that the gap field is always one higher. Um, the, the, the actual number of packets is actually one higher than is encoded in the gap field. Because if you need to add a gap, it means you have at least one packet is lost. So hey, we can save another bit. Amazing! Right? But this is actually quite cool, because uh, ACK frames are sent a lot in Quick. Right? Almost every packet elicits an ACK frame. Uh, or every two packets should elicit an ACK frame. So if you would have this very large, you would get a lot of overhead. They try to trim down the overhead as much as possible by this kind of scheme. So most of these fields will fit in one byte each, even for relatively large uh, ranges. <coughs> There's another thing that they do for the acknowledgments, and the idea is that you have, you want to know what your latency is, right? That also determines your recovery and loss detection logic. The only thing that you measure is the end to end latency, which includes processing delays. So you don't know what <coughs> amount of that is actually the network and what amount of that is just crappy software on the other side. That's what the ACK delay field does. So each ACK packet has an ACK delay that actually tells you how long it took between the receipt of the packet and when its ACK was sent. So you can very accurately know the actual latency of the network. This is done in microseconds. And again, it's way too easy to just send the value in microseconds. No, no. What they do is the value that is sent, you have to multiply it by 2 to the something. Right? By default, that's 2 to the thir third, so 8. So you have to multiply it by 8 to get the actual value in microseconds. So the example is probably clearer than my explanation. So if it was 400, then you send it as 50, because you can encode 50 uh, in, in one byte. Right? So they do this because you will probably never have less than 8 microseconds uh, delay. <laughs> Maybe in a post quantum world, I don't know. Um, but to enable for that even, they allow you to, to uh, negotiate what this exponent should be. So at the start, at the start of the thing, in the TLS transport parameters, you can say, it's not 3, it's 5, or it's 1, right? So you can, you can yourself decide the, the actual granularity of, of your ag delay measurements, or at least the reporting of them. Which is quite interesting. The yeah, spec... You need to build gate slides saying... <laughs> The, the funniest thing about this is in the spec, it literally says that the uh, exponent can be uh, a maximum value of 20. So 2 to the 20th, <laughs> which I have not calculated, but I think that's in several seconds <laughs> time scale, or maybe even more. That's the intergalactic. <laughs> yeah, maybe even that, like, I'm terrible at math, uh, so it's probably even larger. So it's, it's kind of funny. Um, but so, yet another way of saving a few bytes. So I... Two context switches here. Come again? Two context switches yep. for, measurement, for, for measurements per act. This is a uh, pretty high uh, CPU. <laughs> I think this code was rewritten at least four times in our implementation. Um, and. I've spent several hours trying to debug all of this while I was just logging the wrong values because <laughs> I, I had the wrong exponent or I didn't multiply it correctly or something like that. And I was just, okay, this is, this is going way too slow. Why? And it just turned out that I, I was doing the calculations incorrectly. Can you uh, help this, my poor brain today? Delay from when? From when uh, the packet eliciting the act was received. So you get the packet, it gets into a buffer that, that says it, this should be act, this packet number should be act. Right. The moment that's it's put the into that buffer, that's a timestamp, and then when you actually send an act for that packet, you take the current time minus that time. But you only send this for the, the highest, the largest, the right. packet. So it's not for each packet, it's just a, so you don't get like a full for each individual packet, it's just only when you send acts. If you have a very high speed connection, you're, you're only gonna have this for like, Say one packet in a hundred, maybe more. But it's enough to, to get a feel of what the network uh, is doing versus the processing. So I haven't actually kept count of, of how many different 
<laughs> things I've discussed now, but it's way too much. <laughs> it's way too much to keep track. All, all just to try and save some over it. Any questions about that before I go to the last topic? Okay. So the last topic is uh, HTTP3. Well, I have a question. Sure. So you implement this, um, this acknowledgement uh, on high speed, for example. Um, so, well, you, can, you don't generate one edge per received uh, packet. No. So you wait yep. a while. So then that means uh, you have an interrupted running, signaling, alarm. Like yeah, so users. there is because a... you don't know when the next packet comes. Yeah, there, it, the spec says you should act every two received packets. Should. But it's not obligated. It's like they, they explicitly say our loss detection logic does not rely explicit, explicitly on that. That's one thing. And then the, the other thing that they have is the max act, de max act delay. So the, the client can say, I want you to wait maximum this many milliseconds before you send me an act. That's the, the default value is 25, so 25 milliseconds before you actually generate an ACK. So it's either a uh, uh, packet count limit, which is by default 2, or indeed so, a so time. So the packet count resets the timer? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Every X cent resets the timer. But that's inspired by TCP, right? It's yeah, yeah, sure, sure, sure. Um, I, I won't talk about that, but that's like the loss detection logic is basically so no, uh, no delay is 20, 25 minutes. So no, no incurring delay is implied in the event yep. that default can be changed. Yeah, that's again the transport parameter on right. TLS, just like the, the export. And there's no negotiation of that between two points that we, we've agreed on a default? Um, it's the peer that says what it wants you to do. All right, so because the peer can run specific loss detection that relies on you having a certain minimum delay. That's the way I understand it, at least. So that's, uh, that's what I wanted to say about the TCP. Like, um, Quick's, Quick's loss detection is basically everything they've learned from TCP in the past two, 20 years, <laughs> just all coupled together in a single, <laughs> single big spec. So they, they have massive amounts of references to, to TCP drafts and TCP specs. Uh, that explain, you know, we, we take this from there and this from there and this value comes out of nowhere, but it's in that spec somewhere. And that's the way loss detection works. Um, other questions? Okay. Do I still have time? Or? Sure. Let me know. Okay. Is it still interesting? Yeah, it is. Very interesting. Um, so this is the last topic, SP3. Um, especially what has changed for, from HTTP2. So the thing is that HTTP2 introduced a lot of concepts like streams, like flow control, that have since moved to Quick. So Quick actually makes HTTP3 a lot simpler in some cases than HTTP2. Um, I've added this one as well because we talked about it yesterday, is that uh, originally there were no HTTP3 implementations, so we tested Quick with HTTP0.9. Because it's exceptionally simple, it's just get file name and just give you a textual dump of a file. So uh, there are still a lot of implementations that just use this. <laughs> By the way, they don't have HTTP. Does spin bit work? <laughs> <laughs> spin bit works. It's still very much debatable if it actually leads to proper measurements. <laughs> but I, I can spin it. I do. Excellent. Yes, yes, very important. Um, so that's, it makes it a lot easier. But there is one core thing, and it's, for me that is the core reason why Quick was needed. Why is HTTP 2 over TCP not enough? And that is head of line blocking. Now I was a bit unsure about how much you guys knew about this, so I'm just gonna go through this. This is taken from my original superhero uh, deck because I didn't have time to rework it, so bear with me. Um, so the idea- Sorry, Richard. <laughs> I'm sorry, Richard, please don't make another one of those comments because I will have to do this again now. Um, so the idea is you have, you have a, um, so a single TCP connection, but you have different resources, right? Each caller here is a different HTTP resource. And in HTTP2, you multiplex this over the connection. So the HTTP2 layer knows this, 
the TCP layer does not. Right? For TCP, it's all just an opaque bit stream, byte stream. So it doesn't know where the, the edges are for the individual uh, HP2 frames. So if you have a single packet that's lost, you can't deliver any of these other ones to the application because you don't know about these multiplexing logic at the higher layer. So what HP2 did was solve the head-of-line blocking problem at the application level, but not at the transport level. So in practice, if you did uh, have loss on a HPT, HP2 TCP connection, it would be a lot slower than the typical HP1 setup of six parallel TCP connections. Because you would immediately drop your congestion window for everything and you would just be unable to make progress that way. I did a lot of tests about that and it was actually, it's very bad if, if, you, if you even have a little bit of uh, packet loss and a large transfer, it severely damages the speed of HP2. So like I said, that is like the main thing, why quick was needed, why we're doing quick so quickly after HP2 is to solve this, right? So that's what quick does. Quick knows, at the quick level, we know about these different streams. We know that, in this case, it was a yellow stream that was dropped, the packet was dropped. So we only need to block the next yellow packets. Everything else can just be sent on to the application, right? It's still not good for the yellow stream, but everything else can start making progress, which is what you want. It's like the, the last big transport problem, uh, at least from my perspective. <laughs> <laughs> Let's not get into that discussion. huh? Um, for me, that's the last big thing that we needed to solve, and Quick does that. The problem with this is that it, um, it now means that packets on different streams can arrive out of order with regards to each other. Right. So in HTTP 2, if you put things on the wire, they're going to arrive at the exact same order, even though they're separate streams, because if one of them is lost, everything is blocked. Quick, not true. Or HTTP 3, not true. The, the example below there, right? If you have your first packet is lost, the second packet is on a different stream, it will arrive at the application layer before that first packet, the retransmitted first packet arrives. Right? Seems simple, logical, has massive ramifications for some things in HP2. Because HP2 really, really relied on having a strict ordering of packets. Um, one of these examples is priorities. I'm not sure how familiar you are with HP2 priorities. I literally wrote a paper on them, so um, I kind of think I know the ins and outs. Um, so the priorities are done by building up a, a kind of a tree. And depending on where your resource is in this tree, it gets more or less bandwidth. And you have a very nice scheduling algorithm that you can run over this kind of tree. So each, each of these nodes is a single uh, HTTP resource, resource. So A, B, and C can be index.html, JavaScript, and CSS files, right? Now let's say you have a very high priority resource D like a, a JavaScript file you absolutely need to get as soon as possible. You could make it exclusively dependent on A. And if you did that, um, everything else that was under A, so B and C, got shifted down one level. Now it became children of D, which means D was sent first, and only if D was done, B and C got bandwidth. You could do that, or you could just add it non-exclusively. That's the other option that you would just get like a nice... Uh, sibling and, and siblings in these trees share bandwidth, right? That's a basic concept. And that's actually what Chrome is using. So all the browsers do it differently, predictably, but Chrome uses only these exclusive dependencies. Like you see here, it's just one long chain of, of different, um, different resources that are linked one after the other. And in Quick, the, the question then becomes, that's the one in red there, if you add two nodes to A exclusively at the same time. So you have D and E, they're both exclusively dependent on A. In HP2, that's not a problem, because you just put D on the wire first and then E, and it just does the ordering correctly. In Quick, it depends. Right. So here we're adding B and C exclusively to A. If C arrives first, it gets added to A, then B comes along, puts C down one level. 
if the uh, ordering is reversed, depending on latency, jitter, whatever you want, or, or loss, or retransmits, it's the other way around. And so you get the client and server having a different view of the same priority tree, which you really, really don't want. Uh, <coughs> so they have two solutions for that. One, they just do not allow exclusive priorities anymore. <laughs> and this was never actually discussed properly in my viewpoint. It was just like, oh, we have this problem. Oh yeah, we'll just remove exclusive priorities then and move on our merry way. And there was very little pushback on that, which I thought was kind of strange. That's one. The second thing is that they have a separate concept of a control stream in HP3. So you have your separate resource streams, but you also have a single control stream that is completely uh, ordered, right? Because every control message you send on the control stream will arrive in order. You can't send all the priorities on the control stream, right? Because of how the line blocking. If you then send the priority on the control stream and your uh, normal resource stream without priorities, then your resource stream would have to wait for the priorities to come in on the control stream. So if you have laws on the control stream, you would have head of line blocking again, which is exactly what we tried to prevent. So the first priority, the initial priority, is sent along on the resource stream, and all the updates are sent on the control stream, right? Just to keep things easy to implement and reasonable. So that's priorities. Then we have header compression, which suffers from the same problems. So header compression is the idea that, let's say you have a cookie header, uh, that can get quite large. What they want to do is just put that into a compression table and just say that cookie is at index 5 in the table, so I'm not only sending index 5. That only works if both sides have the cookie and index 5. Right? So you have to send it once and say, you know, I want you to encode it in this way. In HP2, very easy, you just send the encoding information along with the first time you do this. Everything works. And quick. No, because you can get uh, reordered, right? And if you would send this information, this single cookie for one stream, and another stream would also start using the same index, but the first one gets lost. The second one arrives with an unknown index. I can't decode it. <laughs> uh, I have head of line blocking again. So what QPAC does is it has separate encoder and decoder streams that it uses again to have fixed ordering for the encoding and decoding information. It still has the option for head of line blocking, the way I understand it. I'm far from into QPAC myself. I haven't written the implementation yet. Um, but either you suffer head of line blocking, or you can say, I'm just keeping sending the actual values until I'm sure that the compression tables have been updated and I can start using the indexes. At least that's how I understand it. Uh, Perhaps a dumb question. Um, can you deduce the original order? If you um, have a control stream that's imposing, can you introspect it inside and figure out the original order of the went on the wire? On the control stream, yeah, because control stream only delivers packets in the order that they're. Sure, but um, can you deduce what actually happened? What do you mean, what actually? And so the control stream is 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 it's it's. it's I say it's my my comprehension. It's controlled on both on both points, so it is on the wire. It's enforcing the on the wire behavior. But it's yeah, not about yeah, ordering, yeah. collecting uh, no. at the end point. Yeah, at the end. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. It's just that. I see. So you just ordered those based on packet numbers or right. lengths right. and offsets in the in the packets themselves, right? So that's those are problems due to head of line blocking and reordering now being a thing. Go back to priorities a little bit. Um, so this is what Firefox is doing. So Chrome had a single long link. Firefox does not do that. They have kind of a more complex tree. To be able to do that, they have these kind of grouping nodes, like the, the dark gray ones. For this, they were abusing normal streams. So they were opening resource streams, but never actually requesting stuff on them, uh, which was kind of dirty and led to some problems with the server not knowing if they should close these streams or keep them around or what was their actual purpose. So in H3 they actually added this as an explicit concept, you know, have placeholder nodes in the tree. They're not expected to actually send or receive data, they just use, uh, they're just used to do this kind of group. 
I think that's the last thing. Yeah. So the last thing is push. So it's been discussed a lot as well. Push is quite problematic in HTTP2. It isn't actually being used all that much and people are, are suffering to get some performance benefits out of it. But for some reason they seem very reluctant in H3 to try and fix that. They want to point that to yet another version, which I again don't agree with, but fine. Um, just a couple of changes uh, in HTTP2. If you, uh, so the idea of a push is you send a push promise on a response stream. So you say, I'm getting index.html. And with the response of index.html, you send a push promise. I promise to send you a JavaScript file as well. And then the JavaScript file opens a separate stream. So in HTTP2, the push promise carried that exact stream ID that you were going to open. That works, but it's very inflexible. So in tree, you just send, I have a push ID. And it can be on any stream that I open. The first thing I send on the stream is just going to be the push ID. So you can correlate that with the push promise. It's a small change, but it's um, it was kind of difficult to reason about coming from an HTTP2 implementation. Um, they have duplicate push, um, especially now when you no longer have re uh, ordered uh, streams. Let's say you want to push the same file in reply to multiple requests. You don't want to push the entire file every time again. You want to save on bytes. So here you can say, there's duplicate push. I've sent this somewhere else already. Just wait for that to arrive instead of me. And there is some, some uh, text about that that say, if you have reordering, then what you should do if the duplicate push arrives before the original push. There didn't used to be any code um, for the same case if your push data arrives before the push promise. Um, but I did a pull request for that, and I included this because I was hoping Mike Bishop would be here, and he still needs to approve my pull request. So Mike, please, go ahead. Uh, <laughs> um, so yeah, that's basically what I had. I can talk about a lot more stuff, but it's been a while, <laughs> and I think people probably want some coffee, so if you have any questions, please do or come talk to me afterwards and thank you all very much for your attention have you started on hp3 with your javascript yes hp3 is actually more mature than the quick at this point <laughs> because i have a, a student helping me with hp3 uh, and i am the one doing the quick so <laughs> i saw I, I have my work cut out for me cool are you going to show us your logging design tool? I, at some point? I could if you want to, yeah. Oh, sure. That would be very interesting. I could, yeah. Sure. Ask me in, in the break. I don't think people want to see it. <laughs> yeah, we or, can just see how much time we have. Also, so. Yeah. I don't want to keep it too much. All right. Thanks for listening. Thank Thank you.